This episode is brought to you by the Weather Channel app. Did you know the app can help you forecast more than just the weather? With allergy tracking and flu risk mapping. So you know when to stay inside and load up on podcast. As well as air quality and UV indexing. So you know when to get outside, load up on sunscreen and podcast. Forecast more of what you love with the Weather Channel app. Hi, my name is Travis McVeigh. I'm an anesthesiologist from Dallas, Texas. I host a podcast called Thank You Notes at Ars Longa Media. Showing gratitude to people just makes me feel good, and I want to share the practice of thank you notes with everybody who listens. I write thank you notes to people and then bring them on the show to read it to them. Past guests have included my high school teachers, my friends, other physicians, and a couple of internet celebrities. I will also be doing episodes that explore the science behind gratitude practices to demonstrate to everybody the actual tangible benefits of practicing gratitude. Listen everywhere you get podcasts and check out the extras on my social media accounts. Thank you for listening. Inside the Board's Study Smarter series is brought to you with the help of Physio, the definitive resource for Step 1 Physiology. Physio helps you reinforce all the major physiology concepts you need for the exam with a comprehensive video course and full-length textbook. Find out more at physio.com. That's physio with an E dot com. Head on over to insidetheboards.com to join our mailing list before March 26th to hear about our super secret offer coming next week. Welcome to the Inside the Boards podcast, the podcast dedicated to helping you learn to think like a question writer so you can study smarter, not harder, and succeed in medical school. Hi, everyone. I hope you're enjoying our Study Smarter series. This episode is with the great Ken Rosenthal, author of Rapid Review Microbiology and Immunology. He helps us break down critical micro questions and offers his approach to tackling step one. Look for more mini micro episodes to accompany this interview, as well as our interview with the creators of Physio next week. Hope you enjoy. Today, we're doing an overview of microbiology for our Step 1 Study Smarter series. And in subsequent mini episodes, Elizabeth is going to be going over a handful of bugs per week for the rest of this month. Today's guest is Dr. Ken Rosenthal, who is a professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences at Roseman University of Health Sciences in Las Vegas. He is helping uh, start their new medical school and is co-author with Michael Tan of Rapid Review Microbiology and Immunology, as well as the textbook with Patrick Murray and Michael Failer, Medical Microbiology, which has a new edition of companion flashcards coming out this year. That's correct, sir? Yes, they're already out, available for use. We will put a link to those in the show notes so that you guys can uh, purchase those and make use of them as you approach uh, learning micro and immunology for your board exams. Dr. Rosenthal, I have to tell you, in the six weeks prior to my dedicated step one study period back in, well, 2008, (laughs) so a little bit of a while ago, Uh, Besides a question bank, some audio lectures, and a few miscellaneous resources, I used three hard copy books. One was First Aid, because everybody uses that. The other was Rapid Review Biochemistry. Um, I was a philosophy major, so biochem had always been a weak point. And the final one was your uh, Rapid Review Micro and Immunology. So it's really an honor to have you on the show today. And in, in truth, I could say in part that Without you, I might not be where I am today because that was an essential piece of me scoring well uh, on my own board exam. So thank you for being on the show and writing that book. (laughs) It's my pleasure, actually. It is a pleasure in in many regards. Strangely enough, uh, writing textbooks is the best way to learn the discipline and as a result be able to teach it better. And writing textbooks is my way to teach a lot more people than I can teach at any one institution. So how did you get involved in medical education specifically? 
Well, as with many things, uh, this was a job, but I've always enjoyed teaching. And so the opportunity to be able to teach in microbiology and immunology was, was a privilege. Both disciplines are very interesting to me. My research has been in microbiology and immunology, and I enjoy explaining things and making things uh, simpler. And so being able to translate the latest information, which I like to read up on, into easy to understand text became something that I enjoyed doing, a hobby, if you will. Well, um, that's a very helpful hobby for the rest of us that you have there. In your teaching career, I guess what I'd want to ask you first is, specifically for microbiology, how do students approach a subject that's so vast? I mean, you've got viruses, fungi, bacteria, parasites. You've got to know all that, plus so many other things in undergraduate medical education. Microbiology is very daunting. I don't disagree because you, you open the book and you see all these strange words and strange uh, beasties, and, and then each one is an entity unto itself. What I can say is that if you approach microbiology, pathogenic microbiology, as a detective story, and each bug is a villain, then the key is to, to figure out its modus operandi and understand how it does its thing so that you can understand the crime and figure out the crime scene and what to do with it. So going back into to real words, the key is to learn basic structures and mechanisms of disease, virulence factors, pathogenesis, and immune response. So get a, a basis for that. Read the simplest book you can find. Go for the simple because you want the overview. Now, our textbook has an overview that I wrote that I think is pretty straightforward. And then once you have that basis, the key to uh, pathogenic microbes is how they cause disease. And how they cause disease is determined by virulence factors and the structure of the bug. And so the key there is for each virulence factor or each virulence mechanism, learn some classic examples. So for capsule, capsule is a classic virulence factor that allows the bug to stick around in the bloodstream for longer and escape detection and elimination. So learn strep pneumo or Neisseria meningitidis really, really well. On that sort of uh, example, what would you say perhaps the top three um, or must-know bacteria, viruses, parasites, and fungi are? So the, the top three bacteria are staph, strep, and then add any one you want. <laughs> okay. After uh, strep, probably pyogenes, I would add, uh, I would think in terms of E. coli or pseudomonas before getting into more esoteric bacteria. Uh, there are a lot of others that are very important, but if you learn them by their virulence factor or the, some key trigger word, then they become much more approachable. And that's applicable as well to viruses, parasites, and fungi, so all microbes. Yeah, so for viruses, flu, herpes, simplex, and... and uh, HIV? HIV, absolutely, thank you, HIV. You might even th throw in there HPV a little bit because it, it gives uh, some other aspects in there. For fungi, just Canada. <laughs> Uh, having said that, I would add histoplasmosis, maybe, histoplasma. Again, it's a little bit different. And then um, cryptococcus neoformans, because that covers different types of infections. And uh, <laughs> some, I guess, associated learning related to HIV in many respects. That's right. So infections that normal people can get, as well as the immunocompromised. Yeah. For parasites, malaria, malaria, malaria. After that, it drops off considerably. Sure. But on the boards, they're going to put parasites because that's the minutia that still finds its way into the boards. Yeah. So as we would teach the course, I would study parasites absolutely last. So it's freshest in my mind before I go into the boards. Okay. That's some good takeaway advice. 
Uh, another trick related to that is to make a list of all those uh, impossible to remember things. And then that's what you study like the last week before you go in, just to sort of, again, bring it back up so that it's at your fingertips, if you will. So those are the, the top three bugs in each of the classes. This is a huge subject, and you told me about a particular kind of learning heuristic that you've come up with that can be applied to not only microbes, but um, really any kind of subject matter within or topic within medical education. Uh, can you explain a little bit about your approach to bugs specifically and, and more broadly um, other topics within medicine? I had to learn how to uh, learn this information just like a medical student coming from a basic science background. And so I put myself in a physician's chair, if you will, and I said, how would I want to learn this? And I came up with an acronym. My previous position, the previous place I lived was in Akron, so I, I can't come up with acronyms. Oh, that is, yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's I know. a good one. That's <laughs> I, I have to throw in a pun every so often. That's a dad joke nowadays, we call them. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, <laughs> I guess it is. So, anyway, so the acronym is Dipper Dept or Diver Dept. Okay, so if I were a physician, I would start off with the differential, the disease presentation, and a differential diagnosis. That's the first D. So once I came up with a differential diagnosis, I w would want to be able to identify what's going on. So I, want, I would run lab tests to confirm my diagnosis. And in microbiology, it was to, to be to confirm which bug is causing the disease, which, which villain is acting. After that is V, my question would be, how is this all happening? And so for a bug, it's virulence factors that determine the nature of the disease. And in terms of other diseases, it's the pathophysiology that's occurring. Then after that is I, and this is the III, if, if you will. It's the innate, the inflammatory, and the immune response. IIII, that, innate, I, immune, I, I, inflammatory. That's, okay. Yeah. For e almost every disease, they either cause or cure the disease. And so understanding how the innate inflammatory and immune response acts on the microbe or acts in the disease progression helps you understand what's going on and how to deal with it. After that is an R, which is for replication, especially for viruses, because the replication cycle for viruses is a must, must know for the boards, and it helps understand the virus as well. For other microbes, it, it, it turns into how do they grow? Are there any growth requirements? Are they anaerobic, aerobic, things like that? Then we're back to the D again, and this is disease characteristics. Now that you know a little bit more about the disease in your patient, what can you expect in your patient for that because of that disease? After that, epidemiology. And it's the who, where, what, what, when, and how of the, the disease. I like to think of epidemiology as an, for microbiology as an infection of the population instead of an infection of a person. Sure. After that's prevention. And the key here is, is there a vaccine? Mm -hmm. And if not a vaccine, how do you prevent infection? Hygiene, special care for food, water, et cetera. Then it's treatment. And here we get into not just antimicrobials, but other treatments as well, especially now with some of the antibody treatments as well. And then finally, I added an S for social issues. So many diseases have social implications for the patient and for their family. And it turns out that these are becoming more and more addressed on the boards. What, what happens to the lifestyle of a person when they have Caesare syndrome or psoriasis? essentially uh, not only debilitating, but maybe disfiguring type of presentations. Yeah. By using this dipper dept acronym, you can organize how you approach each of the microbes. Now, for the, the big ones, you go through the complete dipper dept. For, let's say, the others, you key on the main elements that connect to target and trigger words that will sort of remind you of that particular infection. And really, these elements you mentioned, those are all components 
that students should be, I guess, on guard about noticing within question vignettes, for instance. These are the sorts of things that help not only identify the bug, but can help you identify the answer on an exam as well. So if I were trying to study Staphylococcus, how would I go through this? What are some highlights? Um, Would you want to walk me through a particular bug, really any bacteria, virus, or? So Staph is a good one because Staph staph does everything. Yes. (laughs) One of the ways to to help remember the acronym Mm -hmm. is it's Diver Departments, Diver Depths. So Diver Departments. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. It, it helps to remember the acronym a little bit. But let's take staff, for example. Yeah. And one of the classic examples is a staph infection that goes to toxic shock. So the symptoms... Actually, do you want me to go through the question now and, and use yeah, that? Yeah, to... we, we could bring up that question and, and use use that as a way to, to approach this, use this approach. Okay. All right. Yes. Let's then apply the Dipper Depths um, construct to... A practice question. So we have a 33-year-old man brought to the emergency department by his wife because of worsening fever, vomiting, and muscle pain over the past two days. In addition, the wife states that he had become increasingly disoriented and dizzy to the point where she took off from work yesterday and today to watch over him. Prior to this, he was doing well, and he has recently recovered from getting chicken pox for the first time. On arrival, the patient has a fever of 39 degrees Celsius, which is 102.2 Fahrenheit. Physical examination shows diffuse scarlatiniform exanthem on his trunk spreading outwards, red conjunctiva bilaterally. Laboratory studies show elevated liver transaminase levels. Based on the patient's presentation, which of the following is an appropriate treatment for the underlying cause of his condition? And the answer choices are A, acyclovir, B, azithromycin, C, ceftriaxone, D, oxacillin, or E, valacyclovir. So I could give the answer now, which is what I usually do on this show, but should we walk through it first as a way of learning this and and arriving at the correct answer? Well, first, a little test taking. Okay. I start by looking at the question and and the possible answers. So the question is treatment. And then from treatment, I look at the different uh, drugs that are listed, and I apply the old um, Sesame Street uh, <laughs> approach, which one of these is not like the others. Yep. And then what I see is that there are three drugs that are antibacterial, two that are antiviral. The three antimicrobials uh, come from three different mechanisms of action. Then I go back to the scenario and look at what's going on. And here, what I see is that there are a lot of distract, yeah. but really the key is to go back and look to what's there. The emergency department says that this is pretty acute. The, the varicella zoster, the chickenpox is a distractor because chickenpox usually does not cause disorientation, dizziness. The rash is not a scarlatiniform exanthem. It's vesicular. And then liver disease could pop up. But what can happen with chicken pox is that the blisters, the vesicles can get infected with staph. Mm -hmm. And so then it's keeping your mind open for staph as a possibility. If it were staph, there could be a question that says, how would you determine the real cause of this problem? Mm -hmm. It could be one of the virulence factors. And so the dizziness, disorientation, the systemic muscle pain, the rash, uh, the liver problems, that could be a toxic shock syndrome, toxin, Mm -hmm. which is one of the basic virulence factors of staph. The superantigen aspect of toxic shock syndrome toxin would be related to the innate immune inflammatory response that's elicited. This could be caused by a staph aureus that is methicillin sensitive or methicillin resistant. And then basically the, there's not a lot uh, prevention is staying clean, but it's hard to do that since staph is normal flora on the skin for many people. And then the question that we have here is about treatment. So looking at the possibilities, if it was methicillin sensitive staph, then I would go with oxacillin. 
yeah. uh, which is related to methicillin. So really, in, in one sense, it's almost a three-step question. You have treatments listed, so you have to know the clinical presentation enough to get the particular most likely diagnosis before you can even consider which treatments are there. And and so looking at it that way, you mentioned so oxacillin would be indicative of an answered choice that is for a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. That is what a disease process caused by a methicillin sensitive staph aureus. That's really what this this particular answer choice is capturing. That's and, correct. And oxacillin is indeed the correct answer for this. But sorry, I interrupted you. Please continue. So, uh, as you said on the boards, most most questions are vignette based, as this one is. So the key is you have to know which villain is causing the infection in order to be able to approach the actual question. So, in the diverdept or diperdept, it's that first D that becomes so important. Mm -hmm. How does an infection by that organism present itself? Because you have to know that to come up with the differential diagnosis so that you can then transition to an answer for the other questions. And the other questions would be written regarding the iverdept that follows the initial differential diagnosis. Because as a physician, once you come up with a differential diagnosis, the other questions really tell you about your patient and what to do for your patient. And then that's the progression there. So we can move on to another question if you would like. Yeah, sure, definitely. Let's go to a seven-year-old girl who is brought to the urgent care clinic by her mother after she developed a rash on her shoulders, neck, and upper chest over the past 24 hours. The rash followed a fever and severe sore throat for two days' duration, the mother states that the other children in her in the patient's class have had similar symptoms. Physical examination of the patient shows a flushed and ill-appearing child with erythematous macules on her shoulders and chest. Examination shows a white tongue with inflamed papillae and tonsillar inflammation. Which of the following is a characteristic of the most likely agent causing the patient's symptoms? And the answer choices are A, coagulase production, B, resistance to optichin, C, sensitivity to bacitracin, D, sensitivity to novobiosin, or E, urease production. And you had said before, you think it's most important to look at the interrogatory, which of the following is characteristic of the most likely agent causing the patient's symptoms, and then to the actual choices prior to returning to the vignette. Yes. So here... Once, once I create my differential diagnosis, they want, they want to ask me how I would confirm my diagnosis. What test would I run? Mm -hmm. And so here, it's a distinction between staph, strep, and some other bugs. And when I go into the, to the list here, I'm pretty confident it's a strep pyogenes infection based on the acute sore throat and the associated um, scarlet fever-like rash that came on with it. And so I would go with the characteristic of strep pyogenes, which is sensitivity to bacitracin, so, otherwise known as the A disc, mm -hmm. because it distinguishes strep A. Now B, resistant to optogen, that's the P disc, which distinguishes strep pneumo. Imaginative names for these, these discs, yes. A disc and P disc. And coagulase distinguishes staph from staph aureus from staph epi. So in going with that, again, it's differential diagnosis from the vignette. And then I look at the possible answers. Then I make sure that I know what the question is addressing before I go into any more detail. Sure. And I think it's probably also important to note that, that with an interrogatory like this, coupled with the answer choices... It's not important to memorize that this bug is coagulase positive, this one is resistant to optogen, etc. It's probably more important to understand what those terms mean, and my guess is their implications, and correct me if I'm wrong, in terms of the virulence factors that 
that they describe or unique characteristics of the bacteria that they illustrate? Well, that's very true. Let me give you a, a, another hint here, and that is I think the boards do like uh, the how to distinguish staph and strep species. Mm-hmm. Um, and so one of the tricks, and this is in the rapid review, but it's in almost every textbook as well. If you look at the, how to distinguish uh, staph and strep, the tree uh, for diagnosis, and you go down the tree, the different steps in making the diagnosis, each of the branch points in distinguishing staph from strep and then staph aureus from staph epi and the different streps are actually virulence factors. Yeah. And so it's a way not only to make the distinction, but also to, to sort of remember how these bugs do their thing. So coagulase production is going to mean that this is a staph um, aureus. aureus organism over a staph epidermis organism. Does that have, I guess, uh, it's not just a taxonomic um, point, distinction, right? It's, no. So what... What is coagulase telling us? So it turns out that coagulase is the critical difference that makes Staph aureus nasty and Staph epi not nasty. If you take uh, the coagulase activity, the gene, and you put it into very benign gram-positive bacteria called lactobacillus, it becomes nasty. Coagulase allows the Staph aureus to adhere better to target cells to escape immune responses. And one of the ways it does that is by essentially building a clot around the infection site to restrict entry of immune cells to, to the site of infection. Even with that, neutrophils are able to get in and, and cause all the pus that you see with this pyogenic type of infection. But still, combined with catalase, these two become very important virulence factors that facilitate uh, Staph aureus's ability to escape immune control. Now, mm-hmm. Staph has a lot of other tricks up its sleeve to defend itself, so to speak, may be able to grow in us. We don't need to go through them right now. All right, so this uh, kid has very clearly a scarlet fever. So the answer is, which of the following is characteristic of the most likely agent, which is strep, uh, group A streptococcus or strep pyogenes? The answer here is sensitivity to bacitracin. That's correct. And bacitracin is, is simply used here as a test. Bacitracin is um, an antibiotic that most of us don't think very much about. It's it's an antibiotic that works on the cell wall biosynthesis, and it's um, it's one of the three antibiotics in the triple uh, antibiotic creams that used so prevalently as an, an topical antibiotic. All right. So, do you have time for one more? Sure. So, in this question, we have a two-year-old boy who is brought to his pediatrician by his mother because of a low-grade fever for the last 24 hours. The patient's mother states that he has been coughing frequently lately and that he seems more fatigued than usual. When asked about recent travel, she mentions that her family went to visit close relatives out of state a week before, and he was around quite a few children his age. The patient currently has a temperature of 38 degrees Celsius, which is 100.4 degrees Fahrenheit. Examination shows mild pharyngeal and palatal erythema without exudate, as well as enlarged and erythematous nares. Which of the following is the best diagnostic test to confirm the cause of the patient's symptoms? And the answers here are A, anti-streptolysin O serologic titer, B, heterophile antibody detection test, C, nucleic acid amplification test, skin biopsy and cell culture, or E, throat culture test? And the answer here is throat culture. Why is the answer throat culture here? Well, looking just at the five possibilities uh, and applying the Sesame Street approach, which one of these is not like the other? The throat culture test is the cheapest and easiest of all of them. Mm Mm-hmm. And you should always do the cheapest and easiest first before you approach anything else. So that would sort of put that high on my list. But going back, I'm looking at uh, this is a low-grade fever that in a child, mild 
pharyngeal and palatal erythema, which means a sore throat. After being around a lot of other kids, kids always get this stuff, kid crud. So the easiest and the most straightforward thing to do is to test for the most likely, which is just do a throat culture. And the most likely bug here would be uh, group A streptococcus. Group A strep again. Very contagious, very prevalent, and for a two-year, two-year-old, very likely. So, so what if I get through this question and I'm, I'm pretty sure I know it's a group A beta streptococcal infection. So I go through the answers and I, at least two of these, three of these answer choices have something to do with group A strep. So anti-streptolysin O serologic titer is used to confirm prior group A strep infections but not for the acute setting. You, you, hit, you hit the nail on the head, and that is to get a titer implies time. Yeah. And we have a two-year-old, which means it's probably an, uh, a first, exp- it could be a first exposure, probably. And so there won't be any antibody that early, but there will be bacteria, there will be antigens that can be tested directly, but there will not be antibody yet. And antibody tests cost more money, too. Not, not so much anymore, but uh, still. The throat culture test is, the, is for an acute presentation of, of the disease. A heterophile antibody test would be something more like infectious mononucleosis caused by Epstein-Barr. Um, right. Is what they're trying to get you to think about. Um, but um, although it's typically asymptomatic, we'd expect perhaps a variety of symptoms like, in addition, diarrhea abdominal complaints, uh, otitis media type things, or other upper respiratory tract symptoms in this setting. For Epstein-Barr virus, children are oftentimes asymptomatic. Even so, I would expect uh, swollen lymph nodes uh, with the sore throat. And that's not the first go-to with a sore throat either. In addition, you can't do anything about it. Right. (laughs) Now, the, the next two possibilities, nucleic acid amplification test and skin biopsy and cell culture, now we're talking big bucks and really also special cases, very special cases. So nucleic acid amplification, I know a little bit about that. I'm an OBGYN, so we tend to use that more in the setting of gonococcal or a chlamydial infection testing. A more sophisticated test. Yeah. Now, having said that, there is new technology to use nucleic acid amplification to distinguish respiratory infections very quickly so that a pneumonia can be treated or not, depending upon whether it's a bacteria or a viral uh, etiology and which bacteria. Now, relatively rapidly and relatively cheaply, nucleic acid amplification tests. That wouldn't be on the boards. It's too new for the boards. (laughs) With skin biopsy and cell culture, in in my mind, clinically, to me, it would seem that that would be the correct answer if I were looking for a disease process or bacteria, virus, whatever, that had a localized or particular kind of manifestation, for instance, in the setting of like a Absolutely. Well, a skin, a skin biopsy and then putting it into cell culture suggests that it's a, you're looking for a virus because you, you want something to come out of the skin and grow in a cell culture. That would be one possibility. Or you could say doing a skin biopsy and seeing if anything is extractable that would grow from that. Generally, in my experience, skin biopsies, when they're taken for, let's say, a fungal infection or a unusual, let's say, mycobacterial skin infection. But these skin biopsies are evaluated first by histology and then by immunohistology to determine what's going on in in the infection. I will say I don't want to take too much of your time. And uh, Dr. Rosenthal has agreed that he can probably teach important concepts in immunology in about 20 minutes based on the example of a cut in the skin. So we are going to have him back on to discuss that. Um, But before we leave the topic of microbiology uh, for our Step 1 Study Smarter series, any other pearls of wisdom you have to offer those who are starting to think about a big looming test come end of May, June? (laughs) 
Yes, actually, uh, I have a very important hint as to how to approach this, the NBME. And it's something I've always told my students, and that is don't use that four letter word. Test, exam, it, quiz is a four letter word. Get rid of it. The NBME is a challenge. Think of it as a challenge just as you would approach a big sports match, a big game as a challenge. And the big difference is this is a challenge for the gray muscle instead of the red muscle. <laughs> when you switch that concept of approaching this challenge to let the gray muscle show itself, now you think of it as a sport. Hmm. And now you can say to yourself, I am intelligent. I am good. All I need to do is build up my skills and my ability and show those people how good I really am. And so it becomes a training rather than a torture. So approach the challenge that you're, you're facing in the NBME. Not, don't use the four-letter words. And when you think about it that way, that you're in training, then the key is you have to be healthy. You have to be sane. You have to go in with a positive attitude because with any sport, be it red muscle sport or a gray muscle sport, you have to think positive. I know I'm going to do well. I'm going to succeed and I'm going to show them how bright and how great I am. And that's how you approach the challenge of the NBME exam. All right. So that's my word of, of wisdom. All right. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. And it's been a pleasure. Thanks to James from Two O'Clock Courage for letting us use the Valentine Blast Furnace off the album Missile. Check them out at twooclockcourage.com or listen to them on iTunes or Spotify. Thanks to Kylie Gomes for the introduction and thanks to you for listening. Happy studying! Inside the Boards is in no way affiliated with the United States Medical Licensing Examination, Comprehensive Osteopathic Medical License Examination, National Board of Medical Examiners, the National Council of State Boards of Nursing, National Board of Osteopathic Medical Examiners, or any other licensing or examination body. All exam names and other trademarks are the property of the respective trademark owners. Content discussed during the program is the property of Inside the Boards, or the attributed trademark owner and may not be reproduced without permission from the appropriate entity. Inside the Boards fully adheres to the respective policies on irregular behavior outlined by the aforementioned credentialing bodies.